morning, everyone. And um, you're very welcome to our service today. Um, glad to see that those who uh, were here last night have come back again. Uh, lovely to see you. And um, with that in mind, just wanted to say thank you to the social committee for organising last night. Uh, it was a very successful evening, but it was a goodly number. And we had good food as well. We thank uh, Richard and Sharon for, for organising that for us. The rest of the announcements, um, you know, we're in here today, although the work is finished, and we thank Andrew and his crew, I presume, um, for all the work they've been doing in, the, in the, the church building. The work is finished, but we, rather than uh, getting a large bill from the, uh, from the dry cleaners for a lot of you, we've decided that we'd be in here today, uh, tomorrow evening, the, uh, we're organising a work party just to go in and clean uh, around the, the whole uh, church building. So if you can come about seven o'clock uh, tomorrow evening, if you could bring some dusters, polish, cleaning cloths, etc., etc., I'm a bit miller, etc., in there. Um, if you have a cordless um, vacuum cleaner, that would be very handy, particularly for doing this, this stairs and, and uh, the sort of maybe a wee bit more awkward to get at. So if you have uh, a cordless vacuum cleaner, we will not mention any brands. There are there are more than D Dyson. Um, <laughs> if you could uh, bring those uh, tomorrow evening, seven o'clock, um, <coughs> many hands will make the work much shorter. Then Tuesday uh, bowls have seven. Then cameo is on Wednesday lunchtime, twelve thirty. Uh, there's a page on the table at the front here if you want to just sign up so we know how many we're catering for. Then in the evening at 8 p.m. we have our midweek Bible study and prayer time and we're studying Daniel chapter 4. And then next Sunday, God willing, we will be back over in the church building <coughs> for our family service. I think those are all the announcements as I have them. In the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we are given a picture of heaven. And it says, before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third, like the face of a man, Fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne worship him who lives forever and ever they lay their crowns before the throne and say you are worthy O Lord and God to receive glory and honour and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being our first song today is an old hymn um, which takes up that theme of holy 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 Lord God Almighty we stand to sing
psalmist has said, O Lord, I call to you. Come quickly to me, hear my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense, and may the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Lord, we have already been singing about how you are holy, you are thrice holy. You are God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father who loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten Son into the world. And God the Father, God the Son, sent the Holy Spirit into the world to remind us, and to teach us, to guide us, to lead us into the truth that God the Father has loved us with an everlasting love. And in Jesus Christ that love has been revealed and the righteousness of God the mercy of God, but also the justice of God has been seen. Because he came to live, to reveal the love of God. He died to reveal the justice of God. Because he died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your living and your dying. But we thank you that you not only died in our place, but you rose again to conquer death and to give us the promise of life eternal. So we praise you and thank you this day for all that you have accomplished for us. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and to lead us to that closer walk with God. And in so doing, we will recognize our sinfulness and be willing to confess that sin and repent of it and to come and to live a life that is worthy of the calling of God. So as we meet in this place today, we thank you for the opportunity to be together, to worship freely, and to come and to lift our voices in song, to come before you in prayer, and then to hear your voice speaking to us through your word. To that end, we pray that we will be blessed, but most of all, that we will bless the Lord in all that we do, to honour and glorify Jesus, Saviour and Lord. And this we ask, indeed, for our good and the glory of Christ through whom we pray. He taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, boys and girls, what have you ever seen books like this? Do any of you Well, 
special and you'll say to them, I don't believe it. I said, another type of bell. <laughs> but this one, you might change your mind a bit. And whenever we get to this type of love, this is the love which God has for us. It's a really, really special love. And when Jesus came and lived on the earth, he showed the love of God in many ways. Later on in, the, in our service, we will be looking at how Jesus showed the love of God to some people. But this love is a love that always gives. It's a giving love. Because, as we said in our prayer earlier, God gave us Jesus <coughs> as a wonderful gift and a wonderful expression of his love. Because God was willing to let his son come into the world and live among us, and even though people didn't like him, even though he came and did some wonderful things, people wanted to get rid of him. We may find that hard to understand. Why? Why would people want to reject someone who was showing them so much love? Well, the problem is, you see, whenever Jesus showed them the love of God, they felt really guilty. Because they weren't living the way God was asking them to live. And so they felt really, really guilty. And that made them sad, but also made them angry because Jesus showed them up for who they really were. And they didn't want to accept them. But the love of God, we are told in the Bible, is everlasting. It goes on and on and on. And he wants us to experience that love. Searching for that word agape in the New Testament is to say it's over a hundred times, but then there's the word love, but then there's, what's a verb? What's a verb? A uh, doing word, yes. And if we look at the doing word, love, it appears nearly 300 times. And it's talking about how God loves us, and it's an action that he showed us by sending Jesus. And that word appears so often. So if you wanted to do a word search just for the one word in the New Testament, you would find it lots and lots of times because God wants to tell us that he loves us so much and he wants us to be part of his family and he wants us to know his fatherly care. We're going to sing about, that's a really, really, really old hymn, but it's very simple. It's Jesus loves me. And that is the truth, that Jesus loves us every day, and he wants us to love him in return. So, <coughs> after we sing this then, the, uh, the ones that go to jam will go into the minor hall and see why are going back over to the lads for their time together. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>
details, a man of leprosy. A man of leprosy came to him and begged to him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. Say that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter the town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places, yet the people still came to him from everywhere. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you to get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Almighty God, and it's blessing to the reading of his word. Before we come to our prayers for others, which will be led to, uh, for us by Mr. Jeffrey, we're going to, to sing the lovely old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Just that to sing. seasons, we see evidence every day of the work of your hand. 
We thank you for our weather systems and how everything works together in perfect harmony to enable the existence of life. Yet we also acknowledge our shortcomings in failing to look after the planet as you have called us to do. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to be good stewards of the world you have entrusted us with. When we think of the universe, we can feel very small and insignificant. Yet you chose us, you know us intimately, and care for us more than we can ever know. Father, we bring before you everyone who is facing financial difficulties due to the rising cost of living. We pray that those who are in poverty access the support they need. We pray for those who are anxious or worried. May they find hope and light in their darkness. You have told us not to worry about anything, instead pray about everything. And so Lord, in the silence, we bring before you those we know who are in need. Be with them, Lord, and let them know your presence. Lord, we pray for the war in Ukraine. We pray for world leaders. Help them to make the right decisions to bring the maximum help to those who need it. We ask that you would draw near to those who have lost loved ones in the conflict. Comfort them and let them know your peace. We pray for a peaceful resolution to this war and that no more lives would be lost. We thank you for our National Health Service and the care it provides to those in need. However, we acknowledge the crisis it is in right now. And we ask that you would help our local and national leaders to work together to relieve these pressures and find a way forward to ensure the future of our NHS. We thank you for the dedicated work of our doctors and nurses, carers and support staff in what are challenging conditions. Lord, we pray that their work would enrich and support the welfare of all and that they would feel valued. Father, we thank you for Mark and Mary, for their faithful service and godly witness. We pray that you would bless and encourage them in their work. We also pray for the members of our church leadership. These are demanding roles and we pray that you would help them to find time each day to spend in prayer and meditation on your word. We pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom in their decision-making as they seek to fulfil the mission statement of our Church, to grow in our knowledge and love of you, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, to serve you in our community. Finally, Lord, we pray for those in our congregation who are unwell at this time. We pray for your healing hand to be upon them. Comfort those who are feeling lonely, and help us to reach out to those in need. Be with us all as we begin a new week and help us to be a good witness to our work colleagues and friends. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
because in this we actually have the sick man's belief. Now remember, in the Bible, if anyone had a serious skin disease, in this passage it's described as leprosy, although some people just say that covered a lot of different diseases. But it doesn't matter what name we put on it. If you go back into the Old Testament, into the book of Leviticus, there were laws cons uh, concerning those who had diseases, skin diseases. Regulations about infectious skin disease you'll read in chapter 13 of Leviticus. And the, the thing about it is simply this, and I'm just going to read a few verses from Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45 onwards. The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. That was the regulation in the Old Testament. So he could not enter into the camp where they were living. He could not enter into the tabernacle whenever it was uh, formed later on. He would not have been able to go into the temple whenever it was built. So someone like this, first of all, they were recognizable by what they wore, what they said, and just their whole appearance. So for this man to come to Jesus in the first place and ask him that very, very important question where it says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. There was a sick man's belief. No matter what he was and the state he was in and whatever the regulations said as far as the law and religion was concerned, he had a belief that Jesus could do something for him. He came to Jesus. He knelt and he begged Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. There was a great faith on the part of that man. What was the Savior's response to that? Well, as you will have heard me read, Jesus was filled with compassion. The other translation was he was indignant. Now, why do you think there's a difference between the, the two words that have been translated? One indignant and the other compassion. We would like to think that the word really is compassion. But why would Jesus be indignant by this man coming and asking? Was he thinking, who does he think he is? Does he not know the law? Was he dismissive? No, he wasn't. He was indignant because what had caused illnesses in the first place in the world, and that was sin. In the Garden of Eden, there, there was no illness. Adam and Eve would not have died if they hadn't have rejected God and rebelled against him. And because of their rejection, sin and its consequences came into the world. Illness, sickness, disease entered the world whenever Adam and Eve rebelled against God. And so Jesus, indignant that this poor man has sickness, has disease, not because he has sinned, but because he's a sinner. We all have suffered some sort of illness, I'm sure, in our lives. If you haven't, you're the most fortunate person on earth. But we all suffer some sort of illnesses over our, our lifetime. And Jesus recognizes that this had all come into the world because of sin. And he'd come into the world to deal with sin. 
But the words that he then uses, he says, I am willing. He reached out his hand and touched him. You don't do that with someone who has leprosy or this serious infectious disease in the environment. That was unheard of. Because not only was he in danger of catching the disease himself, but it made him unclean religiously. So if he had touched the man, he couldn't go into the synagogue. He couldn't have gone to the temple because he was now ritually unclean. So it was a significant gesture for Jesus to touch the man. But his words of healing were wonderful. I am willing. Be clean. And we're told immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. But there's another thing in this short bit of the story and this, what I have called a serious mistake. Let's see if we can work out what that serious mistake was from the passage. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. In Leviticus, whenever someone had a sex disease, they had to go to the priest and he worked out whether it was serious or not, they would have left it for a period of time and if it didn't go away, then they were regarded as unclean. started to go away, they could go back to the priest, who will then eventually declare them as ritually clean, and they would make a sacrifice. So Jesus was telling this man to fulfill the law, the law of Moses, the ritual that was, was given in the Old Testament. Again, we find that in Leviticus chapter 13. And he said, I want you to go and do that. That's the most important thing, first of all, for other people to recognize that you have been cleansed. You go and offer the sacrifice. But why did he tell him not to say anything? Well, if you think of what we, we have already learned in Mark, Jesus came not only to heal, but to preach the gospel. And so he didn't want people to just see him as a miracle worker. He wanted to come to tell them the good news about God. And if people were only come to get healed, that was going to muddle up the whole mission. People would have been coming to him for the wrong reason. Jesus came as saviour to cleanse people from their sin and to make them right with God. In God's compassion through Jesus, yes, he brought healing to the body, but that was not the main issue. The main issue was the healing of the body and the soul. And so Jesus told him not to, but you see, the Saviour's instructions were very clear. Go, see the priest, who will then declare you clean. Others will see that you have been healed, but don't say a lot about it. <coughs> but what do we read? stayed outside in the lonely places, yet the people still came to him from everywhere. That was a serious mistake. He was hindering God's mission through Jesus. Jesus wanted to be able to stay in the villages and the towns and to go to the synagogues and to tell the good news of God's love and his salvation. But because of this man's serious mistake, it was hindering what Jesus wanted to do. You know, sometimes the good that we think we're doing can actually get in the way of God's will. We need to be constantly asking God to guide us so that we're doing what is going to further the work of the kingdom, not hinder it. And unfortunately, sometimes we can do that. The serious mistake. From this part of the, our meeting, there's only one sentence I want you to remember. See you today. And that's it.
and this is simply this. Jesus is willing. And we'll come back to that a bit later. Let's move on to the next part of the story. In Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. This is the context of what is happening in this story. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to it. He was getting back to what he'd come to do, to tell the good news. But the context in this bit of the story is that he'd come home. So although Jesus was brought up in Nazareth, we believe that he set up his base for his ministry in Capernaum, which was also on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. It was a trade port on the Sea of Galilee. It was a very important place. There were people from all over who came through it. And so he set up his ministry there. And he was preaching. And people actually came to listen to him, which was fantastic. But the wee house was absolutely bummed to the doors and outside the doors. It sometimes reminds me of, of, of a funeral in the home in the country in days gone by, and still happens if we have a funeral in, in, in the home, a service in the home. They're, the house is filled and they're standing outside, and, and sometimes wonder do they hear anything when they're outside? But sometimes they do. But this situation, Jesus is preaching, and it's absolutely. The thing that we want you to look now is at what happened when Jesus was preaching. And we have what I have in, uh, entitled a strong attempt. What was that? Well, let's look at the passage. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the man, the mat, the man was lying on. They were intent on getting him there. They were good friends. They had heard of Jesus. They knew that Jesus was a miracle worker. He was the healer. And this friend obviously was so important to them. They were going to get him to Jesus by hook or by crook. <coughs> they have to remember that in those days, the, the houses were flat roof. And there, there would have been straw and some mud. And then there would have been tires on the top of that. So to get through, they had to hook through that material to make a big enough hole to let the man down. They're strong. They wanted their friend to be healed. We can see in this their perseverance. <clears throat> the friend's perseverance. They were persistent. You had to climb up the stairs. There were outside steps that would have climbed up those carrying him. Wouldn't have been easy either. A man on the, on the bed that couldn't help himself would have been a dead weight. Some commentators suggest that maybe that house didn't have a set of stairs on the one next door had, and they climbed up and then passed them across. Doesn't matter. But still, they were persevering to get the man there. That's what they wanted. They wanted to make sure. And I wonder. Are we persevering with, with God? Are we intent to see his will done and to bring <coughs> others to Jesus? How enthusiastic are we to be witnesses? How enthusiastic are we to tell our children about Jesus? To encourage them to faith? Do we keep at it? Or do we give up? Their strong intent was to bring their friend to Jesus. And then we look at the Saviour's pronouncement. Because whenever he comes down in front of him, Jesus looks at him and he doesn't say, What's wrong with you? Can I do something for you? You want healing? Okay. On you go. What Jesus said was peculiar and interesting. What does he say? When Jesus saw their faith, that is the faith of the people who brought the man to 
with him. He said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Was that not all? The man was lying paralyzed. That's what he needed to be healed from his paralysis. And yet Jesus turns to him and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. What was Jesus actually getting at? Well, what he was saying was that the man's underlying problem, the most important thing that that man needed, first of all, was to have his sins forgiven. Again, the illness was not necessarily because he had done something wrong. Maybe. But that wasn't what was saying. Jesus was saying, your most important problem is your sin and I forgive you for it. Because these men believe that I can do something for you. And what I can do for you is, is to forgive you your sins. Of course, what Jesus said didn't go down too well. Because the other thing we have is a scaling attack. <clears throat> the leader's rhetoric because this is what they say. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God only? They knew their scriptures, that God is the one who forgives sin. So for a man to come and say, I forgive you your sins, he's claiming an authority that he shouldn't. And by so doing, he was blaspheming. He was saying something against God. He was saying, I need equal with God. Can't do that. Because only God can forgive. But look at the reply that Jesus makes. It is very, very important. Remember, he didn't say anything. You know how it is that when you're somewhere and you just look at someone and you wonder, what's going through their mind? You can tell by the expression of the face that they're not happy or something. But Jesus not only saw the expression on their face, he could read their minds. And so this is what the Lord says to them. Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. They, this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Go back to this part here. Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? Why do you think Jesus actually did? The thing that everybody thought he was going to do in the first place, to heal the man. Well, the thing is, whenever God says to you, your sins are forgiven, it may not automatically be seen by other people. That's an inward thing. Whenever you confess your sin, you're forgiven by God, but it may not be evident to those around. So what he was saying is, you don't believe that I can forgive sins. I have forgiven them, but just to prove it, I'm going to tell the man to get up and walk. Which is easier? Is it easier to forgive sins or to say, get, uh, take up your mat and walk? He says, I can do both. And I have done the first by saying your sins are forgiven. And now I'm saying, pick up your mat. The scathing attack. What I want you to remember from this second part of our reading today is that this Jesus is able. Jesus. 
Jesus is able to forgive sins. Jesus is able to heal. And in this part of the story, this is what we have seen. Jesus is saying, I am God. The Son of Man was a title that he liked to use because it proves that he was fully human. But by being able to say, your sins are forgiven, he is proving that he is also God. Now this is the bit that the, the religious leaders couldn't really cope with. But whenever the man walked out, we are told that they were totally amazed. We've never seen anything like that. Someone says, I, 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 would not, I couldn't come to Jesus because I'm too bad. There's too much baggage that I'm carrying from my past. I couldn't. <coughs> Jesus says, I'm willing. I am willing. And the second thing is that Jesus is able. Jesus is able to receive us because that's what he came to do. He is Son of God. He is Son of Man. He is able to forgive us because that is one of the reasons he came into the world. To reconcile us to God. We are unclean. Spiritually, we are unclean. So we cannot come into the presence of God as we are, but Jesus is willing to bring us and to touch us and to reach out to us and to say, I am willing and I am able. Because of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, he has the power to forgive sins and to raise us up to new life. You see, some people believe the stories about Jesus, but they don't actually believe what he has done. What he has done is amazing. It's something that we cannot do. But he's able to save to the uttermost, we read in the, in the New Testament. He's able to save to the uttermost those who come through him to God. That's the only way. And so today, let us remember, Jesus is willing, and Jesus is able, and for that we can say, hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for these two stories that speak of healing. They also are speaking to us of that ultimate healing that is ours in Christ Jesus. The healing from that sickness of sin that each of us have from the moment we are conceived. And we thank you that Jesus is willing to reach out to us and say, I'm willing and I'm able. May each of us in this place today know that truth. Not only in our minds, but also in our hearts and know the joy of it and the peace that it brings. So hear us as we come to you and 
thank you for what you've done for us. Those of us who have trusted in you, that we will rejoice in that fact. And maybe someone here today who as yet has not said yes to Jesus will do so, recognising that he's willing to receive those who come to him and he's able to see them to the other one. May that be so. For we pray for Jesus' sake of his glory alone. Amen. Our final hymn talks about Jesus coming and giving his life for us. A lovely old hymn. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's love? Let's stand this <laughs>
that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Let's bless one another with the words of the grace as we leave today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.